So good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Why I Care with Creative Spirit. Um, we are joined today by the wonderful Christine Butler who is the Vice President, Creative and Constituent Engagement at Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. She's also a huge supporter of Creative Spirit, has been for many years and um, has a wonderful story that she wants to share with us as well as we get into some more uh, serious questions around disability employment. I really just wanted to ask you know, what inspired me to get involved um, with Creative Spirit and when it comes to promoting employment um, and inclusion for people um, with IDDs. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, so I got involved with Creative Spirit because my godson, Simon, is autistic and he um, is now 21. Um, but I've been involved with Creative Spirit for I think about three or four years at least and just fell in love with the organization and the mission and have always been trying to make sure um, that I spend time on issues that are important to me. Um, you know, having Simon in my life probably honestly like elevated um, my desire to get involved and learn more because I wanted to be able to um, understand the issues and the challenges that he and, and others would be facing. Um, it's important to me because, oh my gosh, you know, that sounds, when I think back now, that was such a superficial reason to get involved. And now I understand and feel so passionate that we have to give people equal opportunities. Um, people with IDDs offer so much to the workforce and to the world and are not getting the opportunities that they deserve. And we have to really take action every day to make sure that they are understood and um, you know, seen for, the, for their abilities and not their disabilities. Yeah, I think that's really, a really great um, perspective. So, you know, for people who are, who are on the spectrum or have other um, conditions like autism or, you know, invisible disabilities, um, you know, what are some ways, you know, strategies um, that you would recommend, you know, that organizations can take to, uh, you know, improve inclusion for those people? Oh, I think the first thing uh, that's most important mind about including them in recruiting and in um, interviewing and etc you know um, I, it depends how a person comes through um, comes through the like the job funnel at a company but I think that organizations also have to be um, you know um, keep an open mind as to evaluating skills and talent uh, fairly, quite honestly. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, like in your own organization, um, are there some like steps that you've taken to really like, you know, try and like, you know, to improve, promote inclusion that you feel could be used as, as a model or, as, you know, that other organizations um, could follow? Yes, so I work at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society or LLS. And one of the things that I'm really proud of is that we have a really fantastic head of diversity, equity and inclusion who has really, um, since joining our organization last year has really brought forth, a, has taken a number of steps to make sure that we do have, um, we do incorporate DEI, not that we incorporated it from the bottom up. So it's, her approach is, it's not just a, it's not just one department. It's not just the HR department or the DEI team that has to make sure she's actually working. We're working across the board on with every team to really make sure that first of all, that we're having open conversations about, you know, what does this mean? Because a lot of people um, sometimes don't know about different um, abilities or disabilities on a whole host of, of, of areas. And we have actually just implemented a 21 day diversity journey um, that is literally 21 days that employees are supposed to watch a video on our um, internal website, uh, take some notes. I'm about to kick it off myself this weekend so I can um, come back to you all. And, and I've been thinking about creative spirit and 
and thinking about if this is a tool we could even use in our efforts. Um, but that is a mandatory training now at LLS. And I think it's gonna be terrific. So that's, that's one example. Um, we've also just started employer relations groups, which in nonprofits is not as often as, as um, standard as it is in the for-profit world. It's become, I think, more, more standard in, um, in the for-profit space, but a lot of nonprofits don't tend to have those. And so uh, we have a whole host now of different employer relations groups. And um, I think that's also going to engender a lot more open conversation about a whole host of issues um, at our organization. What strategies or advice would you recommend to individuals with IDDs who, who may be experiencing problems like unconscious bias or even trying to overcome maybe their own anxieties about revealing their disabilities in, to employers? What would be your advice to them? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I think, you know, exposing, a di uh, you know, what's perceived as a difference to anyone is very brave. And I think that, you know, what I've what I've tried to encourage Simon is um, is to be very honest about it, and to talk about um, what makes him really awesome that he's autistic. And so, some things we've done um, include inc uh, we've done a video that's a link out to a YouTube channel for his resume and because his resume, he doesn't have a lot of work experience, but, and in the res and in the, the video link, he introduces himself. And I think that that really gives um, him a chance to, first of all, just be himself because he's not sitting in front of the person. You know, he's, he's doing it on video in a room that he's comfortable in, um, surrounded by, you know, familiar setting. Um, and uh, to just be honest and to also, I, I've tried to help Simon understand that not everybody is as a, is as comfortable talking about these subjects and, and not everybody is is aware, but that's okay. It's not, you know, it, it for him to find the right job, he has to be in a place that is comfortable and the people who are willing to have the conversations and be open-minded are the people he wants to work for. You see, at, at a place of employment, there should be hopefully, a policy where any kind of bias is, um, you know, there is a policy for how to handle it. And um, sometimes there's not though, but I, um, the first route I think is to try and follow the company rules basically like any other person would. Um, and then, you know, but also I think that having conversations are really important, but they're very hard. They're hard for anybody, right? And especially if you're the person who, you know, is experienced the the bias. Um, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be your job to educate somebody else, right? You should be able, but you should be able to speak to someone and say, when you say X, I feel Y, and I'd like to talk about what that means for me and my ability to do a good job here. Having an HR department or a process just helps with support and, and gives a person a back, so to speak. Um, but, but it's hard. It's, it's a difficult, you know, it's a difficult environment. And I, and I wonder too how, it, um, how it's been manifesting in this COVID world, right? Like when you're on Zoom calls and you're less able to see like full body language, like is it more difficult to understand if there's unconscious bias or is it you know, you know, how does that change things? And as we look to the future of work and probably having more people spend time at home um, or at least balance out being in the office and being at home, I think the, the onus is on organizations even more so to put in place um, things like a 21 day diversity journey or having a training about unconscious bias because it's gonna be harder to detect um, those situations when you're not face-to-face -face all the time like we typically have been in the past. When do you think as a leader it's right to be transparent? And when do you think it's right to kind of keep the curtain closed and maintain, you know, sort of a safe space? 
and how do you maintain that safe space in like an authentic way? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, you know, I think being a leader um, must include a very high level of transparency all the time before you get into a situation where you have to um, you have to make sure that um, you have to make sure that something doesn't happen again, right? I think you have to be transparent. And I think that's why, you know, especially with the, the growth of diversity, equity, and inclusion, job titles and groups and stuff like that will help with that conversation. Um, I think what's important about like when you kind of keep the curtain closed, like you have to respect people's privacy, right? So especially with, for people, I think with IDDs, you don't want to make them an example and you don't you don't want to use a situation to educate the rest of the, the the team you know like that's just not right at all so i think that's the that's the balance you have to be transparent but if you are facing a situation where there's unconscious bias or something else you have to be able to respect the privacy of the person um and not make it uncomfortable even more uncomfortable you know for for them so I think transparency is key and you got to you got to get out of the gate with it you know at the start and um and even if you've been in a job for a long time you know you can you always have the opportunity to ask questions encourage open conversations um you know a lot of companies do um employee surveys and ask are you comfortable speaking up. If, you're, if your team or your organization gets a negative score or a bad score on that, then you have to put, you have to take those survey results seriously and put them, you know, put it in place, uh, put actions in place to make sure you address that and find out why. Why are people afraid to speak up? Why are people, you know, acting the way that they do? There's some, there's gonna be a root cause somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. I think that's, I think it's important to listen, but then take the steps necessary, the action necessary to support change. I yeah. love that. Um, and this fifth question, I think I'm going to adjust it slightly again. So take your time. But um, since you've worked in both for profit and nonprofit, which I also have as well, so I can empathize with that journey. Um, what are your reflections from the two different environments in terms of, I mean, obviously different times, so it's hard to compare and it's really, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily compare it. It's just more of a reflection, I guess. Um, but what would you say are some ways that you've seen nonprofits adapt to, to this mm. like ID revolution, which I think is probably a little bit more fresh in your memory. Yeah. Um, and then in the past in your journey, what are some ways that for-profits have kind of adapted to the, the disabilities and the EMG and everything like that. So mm -hmm. the IDs. Yeah, that's a great question. I think the main difference is financial resources. Um, and by that, I mean, the for-profit companies I've worked at have had lots of revenue uh, for, uh, being a for-profit and they have the luxury of hiring consultants and doing lots of surveys and getting the best speakers in. And that's really good. And I think I'm not knocking it because, you know, it is a very valuable thing in that, you know, when companies invest in take revenues and invest in that education of the employee base, that's a good thing. On the nonprofit side, what I've experienced is, um, and I worked at Girl Scouts before LLS, um, you know, there's not that, you, you're, the margins are so thin, right? And you're, and you want, quite honestly, you want every dollar that you're generating from whether it's donation campaigns or anything else to go toward your mission, right? And so um, just like Creative Spirit, any money we raise, we want to get that back to the mission of helping more people become employed at great companies. Um, and so at Girl Scouts, it was all about um, raising awesome girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. And at LLS, it's about curing the world of blood cancers. And so you don't have that, you know, having, that's why at LLS, having this relatively new head of DEI has been so terrific because, like I said, not just as a figurehead, but her actions to infuse it from the bottom up in the organization 
which I absolutely agree is the right way to go about it. Um, but you have to, in nonprofits, make sure that there is a, a forum to talk about all kinds of different um, things and build um, a company, an organization that is very um, open to conversation and not afraid to tackle the tough issues. The good thing I have found personally is working nonprofits is generally speaking, people who work at the in, at those organizations are, are super passionate about the mission. And by default, at least in my, again, this is only my experience, but by default then they do have a little bit of a op more open mind because, um, because they believe in, um, you know, equity almost as a starting point, you know? So for at Girl Scouts, it wasn't like we thought only about one group of girls. It was like girls, all girls need support. And at LLS with blood cancer, you know, blood cancer doesn't discriminate. And so whether you are a particular ethnic race or a gender or you, your abilities or other um, aspects of who makes you, you, you can still get blood cancer. And so by default, it makes it a little easier, I found, to engender a culture that speaks freely. And I think that's what, maybe that's the whole point is you have to engender a culture that speaks freely about all kinds of things, even when they're tough, even if, it, if it's unconscious bias, we've got to do our part to stop it. We've got to educate people We've got to give them the tools. We've got to grow our workforces that include all different types of people. And so if we all do our part that way and it can start to change a little bit, we'll start to have momentum. And I think that's, you know, that's the that's the challenge, right? We we want more progress than we're able to make quickly. But organizations like Creative Spirit are doing exactly that. And we are making momentum that will help move the needle. And that's why I'm so proud to be part of the organization. And I've met amazing people. I've met amazing people like you both, like, you know, so many of the other candidates like Laurel, Rossi, like, you know, it's just, it's just been, it's been very inspiring, you know, behavior changes the outcome. And I think that it can apply to so many things and your behavior as a leader in an organization, my behavior can change the outcome of who we hire, how we talk about things, how we uh, recognize and reward people for all kinds of achievements. And I've really started to think about that because I, I feel um, sometimes it just takes, it, is, it does take so long. And I'm inspired by what you just said, Joanna, about you know what, it's your mission to, you know, keep going, be in it for the long haul, like Mary Kim said, you know, and that's really, that is really important and it's inspiring too. So um, thank you for that. Thank you for both of you sharing that, so. You're welcome. What are some important lessons do you think that companies can take away from a journey to hire and accommodate candidates with high DDs right now? Yeah, I think we have, I think because of the pandemic, we have to work a little harder to be very present when we are having conversations at work like we're doing, you know, now and on a Zoom um, to, to be more present and to ask more questions around how people are doing, you know, and people have a lot going on. Um, I think technology can only help personally. And I think it was the either the CEO or the CIO of Microsoft said that in the pandemic, we actually accelerated like the tech improvements by like four years in four months. You know, it was like suddenly technology became so important. And I think to the extent that it can help people with IDDs to um, find either new ways to do work or better, you know, it's much more open conversation to accommodate perhaps um, ways of work that are more um, foundational to help them flourish 
then I think that can that can only help. But I still think at the end of the day, it's about human interaction and whether it's through a screen or in person, it's about um, giving people space to feel comfortable talking about what works for them. And particularly now in this in this you know day and age. So I hope it uh, I hope the technology improvements continue and I hope that we can use them to help people do their best work. And the thing is you can do, you know, you can do as many takes as you want, right? Like you can have, you can have a video that where you sit down and you tell someone about yourself and you can choose to talk about a disability and IDD or not, quite frankly. And, um, but it gives you that space to introduce yourself in new ways. And that kind of technology I'm sure is, you know, will evolve even further. And depending on the you know, in the, the type of job you're going for, you know, in a creative environment, like an agency, you know, use that kind of video to highlight, you know, more, um, more things about yourself or do it in creative ways that will actually demonstrate why you're a good fit for a job in ways that may not have been um, available if it was, we were back in, you know, everybody just meet and come in the office for an interview, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so I, if we do even go back to work, I would encourage people with IDDs to use a video to talk about themselves, to show show something that they like, you know, and relate it to a job that they're going for, um, because I think that will set set them apart from other candidates in a very positive way. Absolutely, I agree. I think that's that would be so cool. I would be so curious to see what people come up with. We have to solve the issue of. 85% of people with IDDs not being meaningfully employed. That is not good for those individuals. It's not good for the organizations and it's not good for the country or the world. And I think that we need more supporters and I hope we find them. Christine, thank you so much for joining us and thank you everyone for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more content from Creative Spirit.